oh, this looks like it means Trinity. And then they take that. Whereas, that is a problematic teaching in itself. Nobody has been able to explain satisfactorily what exactly is the Trinity. How can God be three and yet one? How can you have three persons, each of whom is completely God, so that's God, that's God, that's God, and together they are still only one God. The Quran rescues us from that by telling us that there is only one God, وَلَا تَكُولُوا ثَلَاثَةً And do not say three. Just say one. Now as we review the Gospels, we realize that over time, the Gospels were written, not in the lifetime of Jesus on whom be peace. Yes, there was only one Gospel. Sam is right about that. But over time, there came to be four Gospels, which are four attempts to record the life and teachings of the man and prophet Jesus the Christ. And over time, as you look at these Gospels, you see that the story about Jesus was evolving. So that in the last of the four Gospels, you have the kinds of claims which Christians are very fond of. For example, that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. That Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It is in the fourth gospel that you find this. Now that you're saying Amen, think about why it's only in the gospel of John, but not in the other three. If Jesus had said these words, Christians... If Jesus said... If Jesus had said these words, you would expect that right from the very start, Christians would have been saying, Amen. And every Christian preacher would be preaching the same words. Every gospel writer would be writing the same thing. They're very important words if he said them. But why did Mark not write them, Matthew not write them, Luke not write them, only John wrote them, the last of the four gospels. That is because the story about Jesus was evolving over time. And his image was going around like a snowball. The more you roll it around, the bigger it gets. So that the image of Jesus appears bigger and greater in the last of the four Gospels, the Gospel of John. That is not the original picture. The Quran brings us back to believe in that original picture. He was not the Son of God, but a servant and God's Messiah. The Quran brings us back to the original truth. Now what about this idea that Jesus died for our sins? The Bible says that Jesus died as a ransom for many. The Quran corrects that by telling us that in fact everyone is responsible for his own deeds. If you sin, you repent you turn back to God and like the prodigal son you will be forgiven that was the original teachings of Jesus before people started teaching that he died for the sins of humankind now what does it mean that he died as a ransom for many if he died as a ransom for us that means he paid the price with his blood so that we can be released true but to whom did he pay the price? To the father, in which case the father appears cruel and unjust for taking the blood of his son. Or did he pay the price to the devil, in which case it looks like the devil is on equal bargaining terms with God, and that ain't right either. Nobody can explain these concepts, the Trinity, the Sonship of Jesus, or the ransom sacrifice of Jesus. Come back to the message which the Quran has given us. Now, people tell us that the Bible is the pure word of God. And they say, we should turn away from the Quran, we should go to the Bible. And my uh, promise to you is that as you read the Quran, you'll find a world of difference. But it is possible that some people are not familiar with the Bible. I often think that when people like Sam come up here and they preach to us that the Bible is 100% the Word of God, they're not quite familiar with the Bible. I would like to point out to you that in fact, if a book... If a book describes history by gratuitously including sexual imagery, those parts of that book cannot be the Word of God. And I would say that the Bible often does this. And one place in which it does this, and I'd have Sam read that out for you, is in the book of Ezekiel, in chapter 23. So I would ask Sam, as he's asked me a few questions, I would ask Sam when he comes up here next time to read for us from Ezekiel chapter 23 starting with verse number 1 going all the way to verse number 21. And if not that much then start from verse 11. And if he doesn't have time for that much start from just, just read verses 20 and 21. Amen. We'll be okay. And uh, in fact why don't you read this from this children's Bible sure. so that uh, folks can be sure what is there in the children's Bible. Young Explorer's Bible, New International Version, I'll leave that with you. It'll be here when you come back. Just read for us from that. So now in sum, folks, how much time do I have? One minute. One minute. In sum, what I've shown in fact is that 
Although the Quran speaks very positively about the Bible, it also tells us where the Bible has gone wrong. But on the whole, the Quran gives us a very positive way of looking at the Bible. The Quran is not here to condemn the Bible, but the Quran is here to introduce light. You do not introduce light by driving away the darkness, but you introduce light by turning on the switch. And this is what the Quran does. The Quran did not come condemning the Christians and the Jews and what they believe in, but introducing the light. And where it became necessary, the Quran made itself clear. On the other hand, if you want to find out tonight which is the book of God, just read the two. And you will find that the Quran is that book of God. On October 31st last year, I'll never forget the date, a young woman, a Canadian woman, came up to me and she decided to embrace Islam. And after I gave her the opening words that brings a person into Islam, I asked her, what made you decide to become a Muslim? And Sarah, this young Canadian woman, said to me, when I read the Quran, tears flowed down my eyes and I realized that this is the word of God. I invite you to read the book of God. Thank you very much, Brother Shabir Ali. Now we will take a 20 minutes break for the Maghrib prayer for the Muslims and we'll come back exactly at 8.15 for our session, inshallah.